Welcome to the March 10th, 2022 Finance and Facilities Committee, Committee meeting of the School District of Haverford Township. Let's rise for the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, Ms. Martha Q will run us through tonight's agenda. We have four items on our agenda for tonight, and we're going to start off with our construction updates. Uh, Ken Matthews from CBD is going to be bringing us up to date on all the new and exciting things going on in our various buildings. Hello. All right. Well, we'll jump. Uh, we'll jump right in. So we have, you know, some of the typical um, what we had started doing at the couple meetings ago just to give an overall snapshot of kind of where each project is uh, financially. So we'll start with Linwood. I mean, we're down to it at this point. There's not a whole lot left to bill. As far as any uh, pending change orders, that 100,000 really just accounts for two items. One we're in a little bit of an argument with, with Stubner to finalize, and one's another change order that may not even get done. You can see the allowances have all been depleted as we've discussed in the past and the contingency balance is hovering right now around 835. So until we do uh, kind of the final audit of the project, that number and everybody gets closed out here in the coming months, then we'll get that to an actual a final number. Then as far as uh, other things going on at Linwood, uh, at the last board meeting, the retaining wall fence was approved. So that's in process. We need to get a schedule and we'll be back to everybody with when that's gonna be installed. There were some additional gym wall mats uh, that were added that again uh, is on order. We'll get the status of that. Uh, I just talked about change orders. There's really uh, nothing left at this point other than a few items. There's two items that are on the agenda uh, for this week, just some cleanup um, from handrails that were rejected by the ADA inspector, something that is common. It's a kind of a gray area that they get into. So we have to repair them, um, literally move them within an inch or two. And then as far as punch list goes, uh, interior is basically complete at this point. We're going to actually in the next week or two have a, a one year warranty walkthrough. It's hard to believe, but the building uh, substantial completion was April 1st. Uh, so contractually, the one year full warranty on parts and labor and everything. So it's typically around the 11th month you go through, just walk the building uh, with the architect, our, ourselves, JR, Martha, and anybody else um, to just see how the building's holding up and if there are any issues to take care of. So we'll be doing that shortly. Um, and really, uh, the exterior punch list, excuse me, is the only other thing uh, which they'll start working on here in the next week or so. Finish the seating, grading, uh, with the intent of it all being grown in by May. And then we get final approval from County Conservation, from Pannoni as the engineer of the township, that everything's done. And then we can pull out all those silt socks and um, those ENS control measures that are out there and then really cleaned up and officially gone. So that's it as far as uh, Linwood's concerned. Any questions on Linwood? All right. High school phase one, uh, we're really basically closed out at this point. Uh, two of the contractors have submitted their final invoices. There's no more change orders. Uh, there's only one other one item to complete that will be done over spring break for the physics lab uh, countertops getting replaced. The uh, exterior punch list, again, similar to Linwood, there's some items that they need to clean up, some seating. There's not a whole lot of it, but they'll be doing that in the coming weeks. A few th minor things in the parking lot. Um, so that will all get done. And in a similar fashion, the goal would be to have that kind of closed out in May. It won't be officially closed out because it's one permit as part of phase one and phase two. So we can't officially close it out until the phase two work is complete. Um, and then one other item that we're putting on the agenda for next week, there's some additional furniture. So uh, I guess uh, amongst everything, there were some teacher's chairs that were not uh, ordered for the higher tables, like this higher table here. So they're part of a furniture order that'll be submitted to, for board approval uh, next week, along with some other furniture that I'll talk about in a minute. And then in similar fashion, the high school, there's no more, uh, or the phase one, there's no more pending change orders. Allowances have been depleted and there's roughly about a $54,000 contingency balance at this point. Any questions on the high school phase one? 
All right, high school phase two, work's underway. Things are going, uh, going well. Uh, if you've driven by, you can see they've already got most of the studs around the exterior. They framed all the interior walls already. So it's happening quickly. The roof material is scheduled to come uh, in about three, four weeks. So then the building will really get enclosed, get weather tight, then we can drywall and get the addition done. The intent is to try and get the addition done really by June so that the manpower can concentrate and move inside uh, and demolish the inside of the building and get that fit out work done. Uh, in working with JR and Pete, there's a few things we're sneaking in to do a little early. Um, hopefully we'll start the demolition the week of June 6th. Uh, so we've, we've put that into action just kind of as an insurance policy. It doesn't affect the building, but it gives them two more weeks, which the more time we can give them, the better for everyone, uh, just to ensure they get done. So uh, from a financial standpoint, Sorry, I should have scrolled through. Does that say? Chatham Park. Chatham. Sorry, I can't see that far. <laughs> just go. got my eyes checked today, so. <laughs> um, so phase two, financially, no allowances have been spent yet. There's a $37,000 of pending change orders and the contingency balance is hovering right around $300,000 out of the 500,000. Um, so uh, the other item, again, the furniture. So we've pulled the furniture together, got met with Pete and Martha, uh, gone through everything. So there's roughly about uh, $229,000 of furniture that needs to be ordered. That's all being put on the board agenda for approval next week. Gone through, made sure the counts are correct, et cetera. Um, so that's for uh, you know all the music rooms, get all new furniture. Uh, there's new risers that go in the chorus room. Um, and then the green room that was added uh, to the scope and the keyboard lab, all that furniture as well. Is that separate from this contract? That is good. Um, that's in the project budget, but it's not in the, the um, it's in the project budget. So any of the, there's a little bit of a furniture overrun from the original budget because the scope increased and just getting real pricing. So that's in the contingency balance but it's separate from the contractors. It's not underneath any of the contractors. This is a, you know, a state vendor, approved vendor that is, goes directly uh, with the school district. I just keep thinking, I hope this furniture isn't in one of those shipping containers. Uh, like the, you know, <laughs> that's actually gonna be my question like the lab is. Stools. Yes, uh, you know, well, so, with the lab stools and a lot of it, we've already had that discussion, you know, furniture that the high school has plenty of furniture, so mm -hmm. we're not, they're not gonna get rid of that until we're sure things right. <laughs> show up so the kids aren't sitting on the floor. Uh, certainly don't need that. So yes, there, we'll hold on to that to be sure. Um, and if we have to get a C, C container on site, uh, that won't be a problem. Um, so that, that's it as far as the high school phase two. Then moving on to Chatham Park and Cooperstown. So for Chatham Park, um, so from a financial standpoint, there's only uh, $10,000 of pending change orders. Uh, we had been to you l last time with a large change order for some countertops. Those are not needed uh, because the new wing had existing metal shelving that's in decent shape, so there's no reason to spend that money. Um, there will be a, a, a small cost coming back for some, some of those rooms. But so really there's not much there. As far as the allowances are concerned, uh, there's $14,000 that have been spent out of the $85,000 allowance and you can see there's hardly anything built at this point. Really, it's just been submittals, bonds, until they get into the project and actually physically get material manpower on site. So as far as schedule, uh, you know, Chatham and Cooperstown are essentially the same schedule. The idea is to start site work in May. Um, in working with the district, uh, some of the contractors, Cooperstown specifically, sorry to jump around, but these are basically the same project. Um, they've asked to come in on second shift with two, two or three workers start getting hangers up, get a jump on it. And it doesn't really affect anything. And JR will speak to it a little bit as far as the use of the schools over the summer. But um, so we talked about that and that should be starting probably around spring break. And they'll work for those two months uh, on second shift to try and get as much of that in as possible and, and get a jump on the schedule. And uh, Chatham Park the contractors haven't expressed an interest in it yet, but we're preparing for it in case they feel they need it to do it there as well. Um, so that's it as far as Chatham. And this budget is for?
for the work that's going to be done in the summer 22 and then also in, in summer, summer of 2023. 2023. So this, this is com complete. Yes. This is one that we'll see this for the next 18 months or so. Yes. This project goes. Um, right. Well, I, you know, come August, once they're done with this first phase, essentially the project's somewhat dormant mm -hmm. because we're buying all the material now. Uh, so it will be on hand. We're going to work with JR, get a C box on site, store, store that the lights and other fan power boxes, and then they'll have them there. So it should really be no material issues at that at, for the next summer. Um, Excuse me, Ken. Before we go, before we go on, I just want to clarify: the second shift may impact some bu some building use. So I, I just want people to be aware of that. Right now, we don't have a lot of requests for building use because we've just sort of opened that process up. Sure. Um, so there are people who might be requesting, like a small group, like a, a scouting troop or something. I think JR is going to be able to make accommodations for them to be somewhere in the building. Right. But there is the potential for larger types of events that we may not be able to have people utilize the building in moving to second shift. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So, oh, and then uh, the one important thing of note, we had mentioned it last time, but both for Chatham Park and Coopertown, the same manufacturer is making the chiller, which is not coming, will not be installed for the end of the summer. But there's a lot of air conditioners in place already, so that should not be an issue. And then hopefully it comes, you know, right now it's November, but until we get closer, we won't, won't have an official date. But everything will be ready, and it will be essentially plug and play, so to speak. It will take them a week or two to get it installed, but um, everything will be there prepped and ready. And then Coopertown, uh, same same schedule. You know, the, go the goal is to start in May, uh, also start the second shift we just talked about. Uh, from a financial standpoint, there's pending change orders of about $74,000 at Coopertown. Uh, allowances, there's, we're assuming at this point 40000 is going to be spent based on what we know, leaving a balance of 40000 of the allowances to still, that could still be spent. There's been about $121,000 of overruns allocated to contingency, leaving a balance of $178,000. And again, same thing, hardly anything has been invoiced at this point, uh, with the work just, no work really being in place. And then the second part of Coopertown is the roofing project, which the contractor's on board. They've already, uh, getting everything prepped. Material's been released. It's supposed to be delivered by essentially July 1st. So uh, everything's looking on schedule for that. No, no issues at this point. Um, oh, and the one good news at Coopertown, uh, Pico confirmed we had a lot of uh, money in place to replace the transformer there and run a whole new line out to the street. Pico said, what's there is good enough. I don't know why they couldn't have told the engineer that about five months ago, but um, we finally got a real answer from them uh, just over the last three or four weeks. So we'll be getting, a, there'll be a nice credit back for that scope of work. And that should cover everything. Any questions about anything else? All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Since JR has been mentioned a few times, <laughs> JR is next on our agenda. He's going to discuss our summer capital projects. Oh, are you really? Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, today, I guess just push that. <clears throat> Okay, um, tonight we're going to be discussing our capital projects that we do throughout the district every summer. And to tell you, the new board members, how we do it is uh, Martha and I visit every building in the district. We speak with the principals, see what their needs are, what they're looking for, um, you know, throughout the building, carpet, tile, Whatever, whatever they're looking at, and we compile lists. I also have my own list that I know what I want to do in the buildings more on the mechanical end. And then we sit down, Martha and I sit down, we go through it, I get her quotes, I get some rough numbers, 
to kind of give her an idea of where we're going and how much money each project's going to cost and um, how much we're going to spend in every in every building. Then we come up with a list. We kind of see what's needed, what's not, what's sometimes there are things that are wants, and we we go for what the needs are of the buildings. So uh, then we compile the list, and like right now we have the high school. Um, we're going to install bathroom doors in all the gang bathrooms. Um, we're going to replace and carpet in the main office and the AD's office. We'll be replacing the auditorium lights on the side sconces of the auditorium. Um, exterior doors, more for all the security. We've been replacing all the doors around the building, and this hopefully I think we'll finish it. Um, replacing all the fencing around the, the tennis courts and replacing the windows on the press box for a total of $297,000. Um, some are actual, and I'm still waiting on some quotes. We all, so we're going by that. The middle school, um, we always put in for concrete because concrete is a never ending cycle in schools. Uh, so we just put a rough number of $25,000 for concrete. Uh, the fire alarm panel there is seen its life. It's been there since the renovation, um, so it's time to replace it. Um, we're also looking at security cameras for inside the building. Uh, the principal uh, thought it was a good idea, and we agree, so we're going to put some cameras inside. Uh, we're also looking to replace the, the divider in Jim AB. If you're familiar with Jim AB, it's, it's an old divider. Um, and we're going to put a curtain in. I don't know if you've seen the curtains that they put in the buildings now. You know, curtains just drops down to divide the divide the room. The, uh, the divider we have now, uh, we're lucky we have a gentleman that actually makes parts to fix it for us. Uh, if he ever retires, I don't know what we would do. Uh, <laughs> um, we also, you're going to see the variable frequency drives. We want to replace three of them at the at the middle school they are they've seen their life and they need to be replaced and that's all more for energy efficiency we want to seal code the parking lot out the middle school that will help uh, lengthen the time of the parking lot so we can get some more years on it before we have to repave it because you see what the paving costs are coming in at um, and then we want to split up the nurses suite to give some more room for the nurses for patient for their kids not patients their kids um, to separate them and give them their own little areas which will be all done in-house and then we got some landscaping we want to do around the building um, that we want to do the next one is Chatham Park and in all these jobs some are interior some are going to be my guys doing it the maintenance staff some will be contractors it's going to be like a 50 50 um, Chatham Park we got concrete of course uh, we want to start replacing some more of the exterior doors around Chatham we've been doing that every year um, on this capital list. Uh, we're going to be ripping out carpet. I think it's the first floor we're ripping out and we're going to replace it with VCT tile. We, uh, we, we want to get rid of the carpet. Um, and then we need cafeteria tables and we need a bike, a couple bike racks. Coopertown, of course, concrete, doors, um, carpet in the main office. Uh, we want to seal coat the small little uh, black top where the kids play in the playground on the side of the building by the gym. Um, some more tile work and then the windows. Uh, if you're not familiar with Coopertown, Coopertown has uh, wooden framed windows. I guess they've been there originally. I don't know. Um, but we're replacing them with the aluminum case windows. We're going to be replacing approximately 15 of them this year. There are approximately 40, no, I think it's like 40 or 60, top of my head, windows that are have to be replaced. We want to do like 15 every year and for that. <clears throat> Chess and wall, concrete work we have to do. Um, we're going to rip out some carpets that seen their life and go back to tile. Um, as you can see, we want to get rid of carpet and we go, want to go to tile. Tile is easier to clean. It's, you know, it doesn't keep all the germs so we that's the, the the direction we're going is pulling carpets out of classrooms um they have a divider wall between their gym and cafeteria that have just seen you know kids will be kids and they start peeling the laminate off of it so 
Chess and Wallman know both have that issue, so we're gonna we'll fix it. And then we have bathroom partitions at Chess and Wall we want to replace. Chess and Wall, I think it was six or seven years ago, you can probably tell me, uh, the district did the bathrooms in Chatham Cooperstown, Park. Chatham Park, Chatham and seven years ago. yeah, and Linwood. And Manoa wasn't done because Manoa had nice bathrooms when it's rent when it got built. Chess and Wall had the old metal metal partitions, metal doors, right? So I guess back then the plastic wasn't available, I would say, right? Yeah. So that's the only building right now that has the old metal type partitions. So we just want to replace it and put the plastic in. It will look a lot nicer. And, uh, and, and the, like I said, it's seen its life. And then we have some VD, VFDs that we want to replace the chest and wall just for energy efficiency. Our pumps there don't have them on there, so we want to put them on so that we will just save energy when running the chillers and the heater and the uh, boilers. Uh, Manila, same thing with the, the gym divider wall. Um, and we have some tile work we want to do. We want to replace the rugs in the library. Um, they've seen their life. And we want to start retrofitting the stairwells to LED lighting which will also be on motion, so it'll, it's an energy of savings. And we also want to put some VFDs over at Manoa. Manoa doesn't have them on their chiller side. They have them on their heating side. So we want to put some VFDs on the, on the uh, chillers so we can, it's totally, again, energy efficiency. Um, here at Oakmont, we got some concrete work to do around the building, and you can see it when you walk out. Uh, we have some carpet we want to start replacing in certain offices around the, in the building. And I am just put on there and investigate the basement floor. You walk the floor. You, you, you know what I mean. And that's going to be an investigation. I'm going to have to rip it up, bring some people in, and take a look and see why. I have not an idea why it's doing it, but I want someone to actually tell me for sure this is what it is. So we just have no number on that. Total cost will be 988276 for everything we want to do this summer. The, the only thing, remember, is um, like Ken was saying, uh, everything is going to be on lead times for material, doors, partitions. They're all out there at 10, 12, 14 weeks. So this is something that, you know, we need to look into so we can get POs cut early so we can get the stuff in by July so that we can get the work done. Um, the next one is we got is last year we did the stadium um, fencing and replaced all the stadium with 10 foot high, all new black stadium, looks beautiful. Uh, we did some stuff with the gates. I don't know if you've been up there, we have new gates. They go into the turnstiles. Um, what I'm asking is we still have, I mean, we shouldn't talk for Marth, but I think there's still money left from last year's capital project list that we're asking to do this year. It's $38,000 to put a swipe card system on the gates, three of them. I only put pictures of the two, so we're looking the one on Marthard, one behind the middle school, and the one closest to the high school. I would like to put a swipe card uh, on the gates, which they're ready to go. We can do it, and here's the reasoning why. Um, the stadium is a classroom. So Monday through Friday from 8 to 3, it's a classroom. So this way we can lock it up. We can give access to the teachers. We can give access to the coaches. They swipe. They go in. They bring their kids. They do their class. They leave, shut the door. Or they can always shut the door when they're in or out. And no one can get into that classroom um, during the day, Monday through Friday. We can also time the gates that whatever time the district wants to let the residents in. So seven o'clock at night, just, I'm just picking numbers right now. Um, you want them open up at seven and lock them up at 10 or six and 10, or you want them open up at five in the morning and lock them up at eight. We can do all that uh, with easily programming and the stadium will be secure. So we're looking to do that this year um, to get the ball rolling on that and get that done. It's ready to go. We just got to buy all the electronics and all the, electro, you know, IT stuff to get it working. Um, so that's why I put that up. Next thing is we like to go out to bid for a concrete. Um, 
for some of the new board members that don't know this, we usually, I usually put a bid out for linear feet of concrete and square feet. I don't bid it like $100,000 worth of concrete. We just bid it by the linear foot and the square foot. So throughout the year, the price is good. So if for some reason we have to, whatever, uh, do 100 square feet of concrete somewhere, we have the price. It's bid and bid. We don't have to worry about going out for multiple quotes. It's, they got to go by the price they gave us and it holds off for all year. So we would like to go out to bid for that so that we then can do our summer projects for all the concrete work we have. And we've done it and use, we've done it, what, two years ago and now we want to do it again and just to keep the process going. So it makes life so much easier and you get better pricing. And that's it. It uh, looks like it's gonna be a busy summer between the projects and Ken, I think, uh, I think it'll be a good year. Any questions? Any idea on where the uh, concrete's going yet or not? Or I have my ideas of where, you know, where I wanna go. You taking, uh, are you taking suggestions? Yeah, sure, you can <laughs> give me one. Yeah, so yeah, we we want, <laughs> email me where, yeah. Um, yes. All the buildings, except for Manoa and, uh, you know, the high school, we're not going to do anything because they're going to fall under the projects Ken's are doing. But, yeah, we have a we have an idea, but if you have some, send them over and we'll make sure they all get done. And that's part of what the building principals also discuss yeah. with you, like areas where they, mm -hmm. you know, like high traffic areas. Yep. Uh, and they see problems with the concrete. Yeah, There's like. A few, like, paths that have that been mm -hmm. made that are, that are uh, you know. Yes. Our, yeah, our that's mud usually pads what a principal will say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, you know, like at Chatham Park, we know in front to the. And if you're looking at the building, um, right hand side where the kids go there, we know we have to make that concrete bigger because the kids are, you know, it's becoming a mud out there. So we got to do that. We're going to do some sidewalk work around the trailers for there. So there, there's spots, and there's a lot of cracked areas and a lot of aprons, like the aprons out here in Oakmont have to be replaced. I was thinking around the uh, driveway. I'll, I'll I'll send you. A, yeah, uh, not a problem. And, and and also, I'm just curious. Um, what kind of bike racks? Um, I told. Uh, I think it's Jabari. Well, yeah, Jabari. I told Jabari. I sent him pictures of limb ones. Unless those, those, those round. You know the they're, ones. They're just round metal. Okay. Round metal rings. Not the old tire bender like, ones. The ones that are okay. No, I figured so, they're the way to go. So I took the yeah, pictures that Ken had. had. Yeah, and we just figured those. I do. I, I do a lot of work with, with, with cycling. I know that the wheel benders are generally. I mean, you, you see them at high school. They're they're not used. People prefer the, to lock their bikes up onto like railings and such. So I just want to make sure that that we're getting ones that'll be. Yeah, the ones like Linwood is the ones I priced out. Perfect. All right. All right. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I noticed there's minutia, but <laughs> um, there's not uh, summer work for Linwood or the um, maintenance and transportation depot, is that because the, Linwood's in such good shape because it's brand new? Well, Linwood, we better not do any yeah. work. <laughs> if we're doing some work on it, we're going to be talking to Ken. Okay. <laughs> so Linwood, no, there's nothing that needs to be done at Linwood. Um, and the M&T building is in great shape. It doesn't need anything. Just the parking lot, uh, the bus lot is what the, already well, exactly. we already talked yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you as you went through. I was noting like the reasons being safety, replacing obsolete um, equipment, looking for opportunities for efficiency in the way that the schools run and energy savings. And then there was just kind of upgrades and ease of maintenance, which all sounds like good priorities and lenses mm -hmm. to look around and, and figure out what is the work to be done this summer. Um, and then just- Thank you too wanted to say so the million dollars and, and Martha just kind of for the community's benefit that um, these are funds that from the surpluses that the district has had right. over prior years gets put into capital for just these kinds of projects could you just kind of describe that so this isn't additional fundraising this is us deploying funds that we had we had um, right. retained in prior years um, at the end of the, the school year once the audit is completed, there is money that is transferred into what what is called in school district parlance capital reserve. And what would be paying for these projects, it would be coming out of that capital reserve fund. And every year you've been adding to it, so this is where this money would come from. Yeah, and I think that's great that, um, you know, we, we are a district that's largely funded with the um, tax payments from our, our local residents. And instead of socking it 
all away, right? We're able to return it and make some worthwhile improvements to to our buildings, upgrade our kind of capital plant and, and put that investment in. So I think that's a, a really good return for um, our careful management of our operating budget throughout the year. Well, thank you. Thanks. Is there anything else? Good stuff. Thanks. We all good? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. The next item I have on the agenda is for the renewal of our food service contract with Chartwells. Um, we have both Brian Flynn here, who is a regional manager, and Lisa today, who is our food service director, um, in case you have questions. But they provided me with the reimbursement contract. Um, we've reviewed it together. And at this point, uh, will we re renew for the next year? And we have a guarantee in here of a $13,000 profit. This is assuming we are going back to the National School Lunch Program process. Uh, if things change, then obviously things would change relative to the budget process, but we have to go through the renewal process per the state's requirements, because once this is, this will be on your agenda for next week for your consideration. Once you've reviewed it, then it has to be submitted to the state. The state has to approve it before it's finished. So that I do want to say unequivocally, I thank Lisa for the year we've had. Uh, she's been nothing but stellar in stepping up to the plate and accomplishing marvelous things, even though they are short staffed. Um, and I've heard nothing but glowing comments about the food. So mm -hmm. um, it's certainly worth noting that Lisa has done an excellent job. I will echo that. I will say the food is delicious. Anything, anything that we have had. And I've had more opportunity this year than in the past to interact with, with food service um, because we've been doing the board and administration appreciation events for, um, for staff members. And nothing overwhelms Lisa, mm -hmm. nothing. And I change my mind and, <laughs> and I say, well, I was thinking, and I'm sure she's like wondering when I'm gonna stop, but nothing overwhelms her, nothing is too much, nothing she, she readjusts uh, and is very open to all kinds of ideas. But I also have to say, Lisa, what you've managed with a staffing shortage is nothing short of remarkable. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions about us renewing with Chartwells for the coming year? Could, could you just remind us what, um, what the, was the contract length only one year? Is this something that we'll be revisiting yearly or is is it possible that we'd have a multi-year contract at some point? With, with the state process, and this is this process is very much dictated by the state, including even the contract form is a state form where we can only fill in certain blanks mm -hmm. on the form. It, it, it is very, very much controlled by the state. Um, when you get the first food service manager in that contract, it is technically a quote-unquote five-year contract. However, each year of those five years must be renewed so that although we have the option to keep Chartwells for five years, every year we must go through the renewal process. It obviously leaves the district with the option of at any point in time, you can switch vendors during the five years, but if you do switch vendors, you're going back through the RFP process. Mm -hmm. You have to go back through all of the levels of things that you have to do to get. So you can renew up to five years in total, but it's one year at a time. And at the, at the fifth year, you must go out for RFP. You are required. And it, there's a very, very strict dictated process that must be done for that. And Brian's sitting over there shaking his head because he's been through it so many times. It, 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 it is a cumbersome project al almost. I'm, I'm glad that I was able to participate in the district's um, evaluation of the RFP process. And I know Chartwell's um, was a unanimous pick based on the strength of the application. And it's just um, nice to know that even in these 
you know, challenging and different years mm -hmm. in our schools and particularly with the lunch program um, that, you know, Chartwell's is, has been such a value added to the lunch program and look forward to seeing all that you can do once things get back to a more regular lunch service. Will we be getting some kind of a report in terms of, you know, numbers of meals and costs and all those good things? Because I know the the new folks on the board weren't weren't around for any of this. Right, right now the meals are under what is called the Seamless Summer Option or the SSO program. So all all students in the district can get breakfast or lunch or both for free. Um, so there isn't the normal when someone goes through the line, you have to give your student ID and, and either pay or be processed as free or reduced. Everyone is free. So we do have counts and we can certainly provide those counts, um, but it's, it's different than a normal school year. Right. Um, it wouldn't, the, uh, if you tried to compare this to pre-COVID, the numbers w absolutely wouldn't be in any way re relative to one another. Understood. What about on the dollar side? Do we have something so that the new folks would have a? a um, we can we can standing? certainly provide some information. That's also different because with the free program, one of the things that the USDA did, particularly in this half of this school year, is they've increased the reimbursement rate significantly. Increased the reimbursement rate. So again, the numbers are skewed because of this change in the program. Now, at this point, this program ends with the last school day. So at the school year, when, it, when the school year ends, the last student day, this program ends. And unless, unless of course, the federal government decides to renew the program for one more year. Um, that's obviously being discussed in Washington. And, and at the moment, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. But, you know, time isn't over yet. Um, but Right now, what we're doing is we're proceeding with the assumption that we're going back to the National School Lunch Program, but we can give you information on how we're doing right now, certainly. I know there's been advocacy work both by PSBA and NSBA also in terms of uh, trying to help uh, Mitch McConnell uh, change his mind. <laughs> there's an awful lot of groups out there right now trying to convince Congress to change their mind and, and proceed with SSO for one more year. Any other questions? Thank you. My turn to get up. I promised you that I would be bringing you more, oops, the other direction, more budget information every month until we pass the final budget. So this is what I'm going to do, bring you some more information. Um, hopefully you found the last information helpful as we go forward. Tonight we're going to be talking about revenues and we're going to be talking about some of the things that we are adding into the budget in preparation for the coming year. Um, we are still fleshing things out and we will be up until the final budget approval in June. And I, I will continue to bring you information as we go through. Um, at the last meeting, I also provided information that we are preparing this budget wrapped around the idea of the district goals because our budget has to be in compliance with seeing that our students are preparing to become contemporary citizens, working on social emotional wellness and diversity and inclusion in the educational experience. As we work on the operating budget, um, I'm gonna be talking about the revenue structures. And as I said, we're gonna be also talking about the, ad the additions that we are putting into the budget. Um, what we've done in the revenues is we're looking at historical trends and that's what I'll be providing you with information on. We still don't have information from obviously the state or federal government on what our revenues will be. Um, the governor did pre present his budget for the state. Um, boy, I wish it would be real. Because <laughs> the numbers that come out of that are just wonderful. But I don't think that's going to happen. Although, I keep wishing. Mm -hmm. I keep looking at my crystal ball and hoping. 
Um, I know this is lots of numbers and hard to see, um, but I wanted to give you a picture. Local revenues make up 82% of the district's revenue stream. It is made up of various taxes, the local real estate tax, the interim real estate tax, transfer taxes, delinquent real estate taxes, and public utility realty taxes. That's an awful lot of taxes. Additionally, there are things like earnings on investments, building rentals, summer school tuition, receipts from other LEAs, prior year expenditures, refunds, and miscellaneous and federal pass-through funds. When we look at trending, and I just want to use an example, and I don't know if this is going to work for me. Oh, it will. Um, interim real estate tax here was a line that has varied greatly. Um, I lost my spot, sorry. Um, from a high of 6,003 in 2021 to a, an, a, a high of 6,003 to the 2021 actual of only $80,000. The reason it is so low in 2021 was that's during the countywide reassessment and the county itself made the decision that they were gonna stop doing the interim assessments. So therefore there was only so many build up to the point where they made the decision to cease and so it dramatically affected our incomes for that year. But if I was doing a five-year trending, that 80,000 would dramatically affect those numbers. So that's one of the things I'm looking at for those aboriginal outliers. Um, if we look at realty transfer taxes, which is do, 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 that line. Sorry, my hand's shaking. Um, you will see that we normally receive about $1.6 million in every year except 2021. The housing market has been very active recently and at the end of 2021 it was extraordinarily active. So as a result the number is actually $200,000 higher than any of the four previous years and it's just from that big housing market bubble that's been going through. Um, delinquent real estate taxes fluctuate wildly over the five years from a high of $2.4 million dollars in 2021 to a low of $1.3 million in 18, 19, and 1920. So were these prior year delinquencies that are coming in as revenue? Yes. Okay. Um, at the end of every school, at the end of every tax year in March, we take any taxes that have not been paid and they are turned over to the county for them to collect it. They keep track of every year's worth of delinquencies. They make efforts to collect them. And as they collect money, they then send them to the district. So what we collect in any one given year might not be the last year taxes. It could be the last five years worth of taxes, depending upon where they collected it from. So um, if you notice that there is um, you know, a low of 1.3 in 1819 and 1920, and then it goes up to 2.4. I am guessing that they collected some of those two low years in the 2021 year. Um, earnings on investments. This is sad. Um, we had a high of $1.1 million in 1819, and then we finished last year with $56,000. Um, everybody knows the interest rates really dropped into non existence, which, good news, bond rates really low. Bad news, interest rates really low. And so as a result, our income from earnings on investments dropped significantly. It will slowly come back, but you're not going to see anything like the $1.1 million anytime soon. Um, as I'm looking at all of these trends, obviously this past couple of years have dramatically affected revenues, particularly the local revenues. And so as I'm looking at, I have to be very, very careful of where I'm picking these numbers and what I'm looking at because I can't rely on, gee, what happened last year? Because what happened last year isn't a reality. It's either an inflated number or it's a reduced number depending upon the circumstances. So that's what all of the trending is about and how we're looking at all of it. Um, I do want to point out uh, one more thing. The prior year expenditures on there, which has a really large number for the last year. Our prior year expenditure refunds are mostly based off of refunds that we get from our prescription insurance. Um, we get quarterly 
payments from our prescription insurance refunding back to us a portion of what we spent on the prescriptions. And this past year, it was an incredible number that we got back. Um, I wouldn't anticipate that continues, but again, a COVID effect. There wasn't as much hospitalization being done, but there was an awful lot of Rx being done. So you have a, a COVID effect again in affecting that number. So when I bring the 22 num 23 numbers, we'll be trying to balance out everything that's happened over the last couple of years to make sure that our projections are accurate or as accurate as I can bring them. Moving on to state revenues. State revenues make up approximately 17% of the district revenue stream. Um, the basic ed subsidy is set by the state as part of the, their budget process. As I mentioned earlier, the governor made for a strong investment in education. Boy, again, I wish. Um, the special ed subsidy is also set as part of the state's budget process. And again, it's on hold pending all of the budget hearings that are going on in Harrisburg as to what we will get there. Pupil transportation subsidy is broken into two bar parts. The subsidy is based on both the district's transportation activities and our transportation of non-public students. That's where the two pieces come from. Um, again, it's a, it's a subsidy st set by the state, but it's based in part in this case, based on what we are doing. Rental sinking fund payments are the, and I, that term just drives me crazy. Rental sinking fund payments are the state's reimbursement for construction projects that were approved as part of the plan con process. There's been a moratorium on new projects for the last few years. However, we're still receiving reimbursement for earlier projects. This is an area that we have been have under review to make sure we're obtaining all the funds that are available to this district through this process. Health services is a reimbursement based on various health costs throughout the district. Each year, the district needs to file an extensive report on nursing, medical, and other health-related issues, the district then receives a small percentage of the actual costs that were expended. State property tax reduction allocation is that allocation that comes for the homestead farmstead property tax reduction. This is a result of the state adding gambling to their revenue stream. Um, this amount has remained flat or basically flat. If you look at the numbers, they're not exactly the same, but boy, are they close um, for the five year period. And there is absolutely no anticipation in changing that stream. The same holds true for the ready to learn block grant that has been set at the 192,000 and it will remain at 192,000. Um, this basically leaves the social security and retirement contributions from the state. At the last meeting, I talked extensively, got on my little soapbox, about how the district cannot control the costs of retirement system. Um, Social Security costs the district 7.65%. PCERS over the five-year period has gone from just over 30%, 30.03, to 34.94 in this five-year period that we're showing. Next year's is 35.26. So in 2021, 42.59% of salaries is there is an additional cost to the district. So for every dollar I pay you, another 43 cents and using round terms has to be put aside in expenditures for just those two items. For 22-23, that number will become 42.91. Again, the 43%. However, the state is required to reimburse us approximately 50% for both the Social Security payments and the PEASERS payments. So the revenue that you see on this chart is based off of that 50% reimbursement. And I'm, when I say approximately, there has, there's things of, in the Social Security side of are they new employees, and I don't mean new hires, it has to do with the date you went in through the system. So you could have I, I am considered a new hire. I've been in the system 20 years. Um, so there's, it has to do with the way social security system defines how, when I came into the system. Um, and the PEASERS, there are certain things that we pay that are not PEASERS eligible. 
and I'll use an example, we have an opt-out plan for our insurance. If, if an employee decides not to take our health care, dental, and vision, they potentially can have a certain amount of money in lieu of taking our insurances. That opt-out piece is not PCERS eligible. So not every dollar of what we pay out in salaries has a PCERS piece against it. So when I say approximately 50%, there's things that affect it. And obviously in Social Security, there's also the limit on how much somebody has to pay in in a given year. The last area would be our federal federal make federal re revenues make up less than one percent of the revenue stream. If we go back to local revenues and add in what was called IDEA pass-through funds, well, because they're federal funds, but they just don't come to us through the federal government. They come to us through the IU to get to us. And so therefore it makes them local revenues even though they are federal revenues. But even if I add that in, that makes the federal revenue as a whole 1.3% of our revenue stream. So giving them the benefit of the doubt, they have 1.3%. Um, Title I, Title II, and Title IV are our constant ongoing programs. Um, they have very specific requirements for their use. You know, uh, the one is for the students in the underprivileged areas. The other one is for professional development for teachers. Um, the other medical, the other um, federal item is school-based access, um, which is a reimbursement to the district for very specific special education costs. This also requires extensive reporting, and I'm so thankful we have help in that. Um, and this is another area that we are examining to confirm we are getting everything we can get through this school-based medical access program. Um, there are in the last two column, in the last column, increases that are from those various ESER funds. Those are obviously those special grants that are being done because of the COVID environment. They are, I'm, I'm going to say, quote unquote, one time found money as it were, and they will go away once the grant is used they won't come back. And just to let you see the graphic of this year's budget, this is the 21-22 budget, you see that big part of the pie that is our local revenues, the second biggest part is our state revenues, and those two itty bitty pieces, one is the federal piece, and then there's a very fine sliver because we budgeted for a thousand dollars in selling off an asset so um, you can see dominantly our local t taxes our local revenues make up the bulk of what our revenues are at our next meeting i will be bringing you the 22 23 budgeted numbers for our all of our revenues and the next slide here i'm actually going to be turning over to dr rushi because this is talking about the various things that we are adding into the expenditures for the coming year. So at the next meeting, we'll talk about expenditures. As well. Um, but we wanted to at least give you a little bit of insight into what we're taking a look at already f in, within the budget. And all of these expenditures that are listed here this evening um, are in the category of personnel. They are posi these positions are included because they are based upon the enrollment growth and hence, with enrollment growth comes staffing increases that we have experienced over the last several years. Whether you've been seated here at the board table or out in the, in the audience prior to becoming a board member, you've heard us speak of the importance of several of these roles in the past. In prior years, we've had to make the very difficult decision to remove some of these positions from the proposed budget as we got towards the end of the budget process. We are hopeful this year to maintain these additions as they are based upon, as I mentioned, growth across the district that the district has experienced. So the first position that's listed up there is the assistant HR director, which we began talking about two years ago. Um, and we're really happy that looking at the model that we are looking at of having Dr. Raimundo serve in that, in that role. Um, and then we look towards bringing an interim HR director in to work with, work with him throughout the year next year uh, to then move him into that position of director of HR. The custodial supervisor was actually a position that we had in place and we eliminated it uh, after a retire retirement. So we took advantage of the attrition 
to look at a way to reduce some of the expenditures uh, in the budget either two or three years ago. We have commented several times throughout these last two years with, to JR that what a time for us to have eliminated a position of custodial supervisor when you look at all of the work that is that's going on in the district. But so we continue to put these positions back on there. A position that we have not spoken about before is an additional security assistant at the middle school. The middle school now has just a little bit over 1600 students in there. The high school had two security assistants several years ago when the enrollment at the high school was 1500, 1500 students. So the, given the number of students that are in there, um, it's just a, we're looking again at the safety um, in the building, um, the functions that this individual performs and the need for uh, someone to be out and about um, in that building on a particular, uh, you know, having a particular area to su supervise when students are there. Several years ago, we added a guidance counselor to Chestnutwald, and at the time, we had said that we would look to do add a guidance counselor at each one of our elementary buildings. Uh, we chose Chestnutwald because the enrollment was well over 600 students. Manoa had two guidance counselors with an enrollment of over 700, 700 students. Well, not only the enrollment numbers, but looking at the needs of our students, looking at social emotional wellness and what we're trying to accomplish, we want to continue that trajectory. Well, we don't have a specific number here because I'm waiting for all of the, all of the expenditures to look at what we think we can manage um, within the budget, but our goal is to eventually have an additional guidance counselor, not additional, two guidance counselors to meet the needs of the students in our each of our elementary buildings. At a prior meeting, um, you'll re prior curriculum meeting, you re recall hearing uh, Jen Saxa and Pete Dunnegy talk about adding financial literacy as a graduation requirement. And at that time, we shared with you that that would require an additional business teacher at the high school. The next three um, are I, positions up there are identified specifically for the high school, uh, social studies, math, and health and phys ed, uh, and due entirely to the enrollment. And just uh, as a reminder for um, folks who may be viewing this at a later time, we will be a little over 2,000 students um, in our high school next year. The smallest class in the high school right now is the senior class. Uh, and they will not have a class of under 500 students for several years to come now. Uh, the next three positions that are identified there, the elementary autistic support, emotional support, and learning support are all within that category of special education and looking at the growth that is occurring in those, in those areas. We know the autistic support at the elementary level that we, we already know we have a need to open another classroom where that will be you you know that that takes more discussion mm -hmm. uh, where that will be but we know from the students that we have and the early intervention meetings that have already occurred that combined with looking at the age differential uh, in terms of how the numbers of students that you can have in the room at the same time we know that we have the need for one autistic support teacher we also know that the need for learning support is one um, emotional support our pupil services folks are still going through the process of working with staff at the building level to look at what those counts will be for next year uh, to best to determine if that would be one, one and a half, or you know, two, two people. Um, but th this is what we're beginning with, um, and we will, you know, we'll look to if we need to prioritize and say what would be something that we wouldn't put in there. We'll, we will be prepared to do that at, at the point in time. But we are hopeful that as we move forward, we'll be able to keep as many of these um, positions in the budget as possible. So um, having gone through all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions, actually. So if we're looking at 10 or so, uh, 10, 12 positions here, just ballpark, is that like a million and a half uh, in that vicinity? Mm -hmm. Salary and benefits? Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah, but when you put the benefits piece into it as well. I Second that's question. That's a million and a half. Um, oh, that would be my guess, but. Okay, I'm sorry. The million and a half would be a guess, but right. I'd have to go back and look. 
the uh, on the uh, autistic support side we operate under it there's a state law that specifies the number of autistic students that can, that be, can be in the classroom that can, mm -hmm. that can be in the classroom and the age differential that you can have with you know with, so if we said well you know within this building there are six students but if those six students span kindergarten through fifth grade um, you can't have those that age differential in the in the classroom now sometimes scheduling can help with that if you have children who are able to be out in the general population more so than than maybe some others um, but typically you know there's a waiver process that you would need to need to go through um, but if it's we're more than one or two over would be more than one or two over if we don't add the additional so we're required by mm -hmm. state law mm -hmm. given the yeah. zoning that you just mentioned thank you okay um next month when we come to our committee meeting we'll be providing information on the expenditures and we'll be pulling this whole thing together on the 21st where we're going to be presenting the proposed final budget to the board for their consideration so the 18th is an important day um, and as I said actually that date the 12th got changed today it's now the 18th so that Make note. Committee that's now the committee doesn't during spring break. That's what we were right. Going it to. was avoiding the spring break. So then that's why it got moved. Um, so the next meeting will be the 18th. We'll be presenting the proposed final budget. We'll be presenting the proposed fi final budget and asking you to give us the ability to advertise that you intend to act on it at the May 5th meeting. Um, we'll have more budget presentations including working our way up to the final budget, which will be taken action on on June 16th. Thanks said all that. Any questions? I, I had some questions. Um, one thing I think um, is probably commonly misunderstood is that the district doesn't get revenue based on enrollment. Um, you know, like, our real estate taxes aren't linked to um, to enrollment, um, but are there are there some of these funds that we need to um, we need to? You, I think you gave a couple examples that we need to manage or apply for that they aren't just kind of tax-based or entitlements, but we need to seek them out or apply for them or compete for them that, we're, that we have in our revenue budget? Um, I mentioned the health plan. That's one of the ones that we have. To, if, if you don't fill out the report, you don't get the money. So we every year fill out a report. It's called the SHARS report, and it's a very large report. Um, you have to report how many cases the nurse saw throughout the year. You have to include all of the non-public activity and how many cases they saw throughout the year. How many did you have physicals and, and how many physicals were done in the building? And it's, it includes including the, like your nurse's license numbers and things like that. You have to have a lot of information in these reports. Um, so, but that's one that you do every year. And obviously we have a great deal of expense in that area. We got $140,000. So, you know, it's, it, it is, but it's $140,000. I'm not walking away from it. Um, the same thing with the medical access. There is quarterly reporting. There's ongoing reporting for medical access, and it involves how much time did this person spend with special ed students in this setting and, and how much transportation expense and so on and so forth all throughout the year has to be done. And there's two different levels of the, the, the medical access funding. One is, I'm going to say, time and materials, for lack of a better description, it's a very small amount. We get about $25,000 in that particular area. The other area is a reimbursement for our costs, and it's a massive report that has to be done. And it's done in quarterly pieces, but then there's a report that's done at the end of the year that summarizes all of this. And then, having done all that, we still need to, to submit a form that says, can we please have some money? <laughs> Um, so that's one of the ones that we're obviously looking into to make sure we're getting the money that we should be getting. Um, it's not automatic. It's, it, it isn't a case of, okay, you did all this work and we're going to send you them. No, you have to actually ask to get the money and you have to provide, here's where we're using the money. 
we've spent a year proving we're using the money, but then I have to send a report in that says, here's where we're using it. So it's kind of an interesting process there. So there's a couple different areas like that that we have that aren't an automatic here. That's the give me. Yeah, no, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's just kind of amazing all that goes into getting the revenues to run this, the ones that have more reporting, compliance, mandates attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this just shows the, the range of sources that the district taps into to fund our programs and activities, and it, it's really expansive. Um, I think one of the things that I kind of took comfort in looking at the local revenues, even though you were pointing at um, variations over the five years, mm -hmm. you know, some things go up and down, that bottom line from local revenues has kind of steadily um, increased, even if some of the components of it were less or, or more from prior years. Um, so hopefully as you're going through the budgeting process, there is some baseline, you know, stability or trend that you can, mm. you can plan with. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll be interested in, in following that. I think um, one of, you know, when we look at the, the budget and I appreciate how you started the session with looking at our goals, um, it, it like, one of the things I try to tie the numbers to is, you know, these are programs for the kids in our school. So in places where we can look at dollars per student or, you know, um, things like that, that kind of just make the overall 130 plus million dollar budget a little more kind of tangible and meaningful. Um, I think that would be helpful to just um, kind of tell the story of, um, you know, where we get these funds. And then when we look at the expenses, you know, how they benefit the kids, the classrooms, the schools. Any other comments or discussion? Yeah, you know, and again, for, for the benefit of folks that are new and are going through this for the first time, um, you know, the, the local revenue, um, the lion's share of it, we know is based on the, the tax bills from last year. There's a little bit of variability on some of the things like, um, you know, transfer taxes and, and the delinquency collections, but essentially, um, you know, the the uh, the real estate taxes <coughs> don't go down. Um, if you look at the state revenue, uh, the basic ed funding and the special ed funding also don't go down the thing is that we don't know how much they'll they will go up um, that we won't know that probably until june 30th at which point we will already have had to pass our budget okay so that's built into the process mm -hmm. the uh, federal revenue mm, doesn't generally go up uh, we, we can't really assume. I mean, we have the, the ESSER pieces, but that's one-time money. One-time money. Um, and it's amazing for that 1% of our budget, the amount of regulatory hoops that we have to jump through um, to be in compliance to get that 1% of money. Um, so given all of that, we, you know, we get to that nice, nice pie chart, and then we look at where we are in terms of needs for additional positions and you know we clearly are in a situation where enrollment keeps going up and if you have more kids you need people to teach them um, but uh, if we if we take our best estimates which i think martha's doing a great job with looking at those five-year numbers that's a nice way to look at it and you look at what our anticipated revenue is. You look at what the estimated cost of bringing these new positions on and keep in mind that, what are, are we at like 74% salary and benefits? It's somewhere. It's, it's approximately 75. You know, so there's not a lot of discretionary wiggle room in the budget. It's not like you can say, I mean, how many paper clips can you save? You know, is, <laughs> is what it comes down to. There's, there's not a lot of, of room. And the other uh, 
hard and fast part here is the Act One index, which says that essentially we can't raise taxes more than you know this statewide average weekly wage and inflation index that the state provides to us each year. So those are sort of the major big pieces that go into this thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have these preliminary budgets, we have proposed final budgets. It used to, when I first came on the board, it used to remind me of like the way that they grade olives, you know, there was like large colossal, super colossal. <laughs> so we, you know, they're all just big olives. So we, you know, with the budget, we have these different versions of the budget that all drive towards uh, us passing a budget before June 30th. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, as, as we take the ride between now and June 30th, certainly don't hesitate if you have any questions. So I do have a question. Um, as I'm looking at the district goals, you know, preparing contemporary citizens, social emotional wellness, I'm able to tie those goals to the positions that's being added. So where would I see that in terms of diversity and, and inclusion? What focus in terms of hiring, resources, staff, et cetera, would I see that goal being um, really focused on in, in the budget? That would be more in terms of looking at what implication the strategic plan is having. So it might be in the way, not necessarily an in increase in dollars, but the way in which monies are being spent within resources in the classroom, within professional development, uh, within the job fair, like there are fees to go to job fairs and, and things like that that our staff participate in. So it's not going to be necessarily delineated as, as its own separate item in the budget, but moving forward, we can point out some of those things. Okay. So maybe look at, key, you know, when we talk about what some of those areas that are going to increase, maybe do it through that lens, mm -hmm. and that might help. I guess I'm, I'm more so thinking about, like, when I'm looking here, absolutely the hiring of, of teachers and staff speaks to that well-rounded citizen. When I'm looking at um, emotional support teachers, guidance counselors, absolutely that's hitting on the social emotional wellness. And so I'm wondering if um, moving forward, if the district is looking at actual positions that are tied to diversity and inclusion initiatives. Well, we do have like our director of learning and assessment Mm -hmm. uh, that is within that position. One of the responsibilities is bringing leadership to the work that we're doing around diversity and, and inclusion. Okay. That, and that was the position that Sarah right. held. Mm -hmm. So you would hear from Sarah at, you know, at different points in time mm -hmm. um, speaking about that work. Uh, so uh, Christina Carter, our new hire, will be someone who will be continuing to bring leadership to, to that work. Um, and I think when we hear, when we get an update from the strategic planning team, looking at each one of those three areas and some of the work that they have planned moving forward, um, as I said, it may not be an increase in funds, but it might be, we're going to use these funds this way. Okay. And I can imagine it also being, um, you know, if we have a line item for uh, new textbooks, it's in the process of selecting the textbooks. And when we say we're going to be hiring staff, um, it's with it a, a lens and a value of having our staff reflect the diversity of our community, right? Like that the line items are there, but some of it's just in um, the application and the choices that we make in those funds, you know, how we enact um, those rather than it being like, oh, this is a DEI line item. It's embedded throughout the budget and the practice that we have. Also in the superintendent's goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hearing none, the meeting is now yours. Well, if the meeting is mine, I think I can say that we are at the point of being adjourned. Um, the one um, scheduling notice was, uh, as mentioned there on, on the schedule, the correction that um, we are going to post a date change for the next meeting of this Finance and Facilities Committee committee meeting so that it doesn't occur during the week of spring break. It will move to Monday, April 18th. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.